Hello and welcome to the EDH Retcast. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. First up, the guy who loves to cast Colossification onto one of his creatures to make it huge. That's Matt Morgan. So my girlfriend asked me to stop singing Wonderwall to her. And I said, maybe. <laughs> is that a lyric joke? That is Matt? the lyrics. It's been a long time since I've heard that song. Joey, so you I'm... are not going to be the one that saves me. <laughs> I'm I'm having a full on internet embarrassment moment because all of the listeners are totally going to know this song. That and I don't song know the is lyrics older than and... you. I I will forgive you this time. <laughs> oh man! Next up, the guy who likes to use Colossification to tap an enemy creature so that he can swing in for lethal. That's Dana Roach. Uh, so we're two weeks in right now of companions just wrecking every other format, and I think given the pr- the progression from. To fairy, to veil of summer, to once upon a time, to Oko, to underworld breach, now to companions. Um, core set this summer is going to have a card that literally just punches your opponent in the face. <laughs> and I, like that's the only place to go from here is you drop it and it physically assaults your opponent. Well, I think the the course that's going to be a Teferi themed set, so it might just rewind the that game right, in case maybe. you would lose or something like that. Absolutely. Anyway, this is the EDH Retcast. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks. And what we'd like to do here on the podcast is give all that data a little more context. Hey, Dana, what are we talking about this week? We are going to talk about um, the pre-con upgrade feature on EDH Rack. Indeed, those new pre-cons are out, got those deck lists out in the world, um, and people are already making some changes to them, and there is a feature on EDH Rec that measures those changes, and we want to take a look and see what people are doing uh, to upgrade those, see what we think about the changes that are being made to those pre-con deck lists to make them even better if we've got any other things to offer, uh, any other ideas for them. But before we get to that, we have to give a huge thank you to Josh Lequai and the team at the Command Zone, who handle all the post-production work on the podcast, making it look super spiffy. They do such a great job. Thank you guys so much. And also, so thank you to our sponsors, Card Kingdom and TCG Player, who provide the up-to-date price information for the card images on EDH Rec. If you want to make any of the upgrades that we're going to be talking about in this episode, we just can't recommend the services of Card Kingdom and TCG Player enough. All you have to do is click on those price tags on EDH Rec to go right to their storefronts. And also, if you use cardkingdom.com, you can go to cardkingdom.com slash EDH Rec to let them know that we sent you. So guys, pre-con upgrade guide. What is this? Where can you find it on the site? How can people access this feature on EDH Rec to help upgrade those pre-cons. So the pre-con upgrade is actually a pretty easy tool to utilize. All you have to do is just go to edhrec.com. Kind of a no-brainer there, I know. But go to the sets tab up at the top and you can click that and it'll take you down to the most recent sets that we have. And at the bottom of that, it's going to say pre-con upgrades. All you do is got to click that and it'll take you to every single pre-con that we've had so far and has everything listed out. You can click on a shortcut to go to a specific year, but you can just click on any given deck. So say we want to look at Calamax decks and, and what people are doing to upgrade that pre-con after they get it and take it out of the box. So you go to the sets, go to pre-con upgrades, and it'll take you to that. And at the very top, obviously, Commander 2020, we just had, and just click on Calamax right there and it will take you to all the different cards people are adding all the different cards people are taking out. It'll even help you create a good land base for that deck and just how to upgrade Arcane Maelstrom into a better functioning deck than it is right out of the box. Yeah, you can do that for any of those face commanders that are showing up there. And actually, if you're on the main EDHREC page for any of those commanders, there is a small section uh, down beneath their image that allows you to just hit the precon upgrades page right from their actual EDHREC page if you want to see uh, some of those changes. So you can use just the uh, precon thing through sets. It's just edhrec.com slash precon, or you can use just on the uh, commander's page. And so what we're going to do is just take a look through some of these. What changes are people making? Do we agree? Are there any other changes that we would like to make? Let's start off with that Calamax deck, what are some of the cards that we're seeing people remove and what do we think of them? Um, the, the first one they're adding here is Primal Amulet, which is the Ixalan flip in, uh, artifact that turns into a land and it makes instant sorcery spells you cast cost one less, which is just useful in the deck in general. And whenever you cast an instant sorcery spell, you put a charge counter on it. And if there are four or more charge counter on it, you flip it into Primal Wellspring, which is a land that you can tap to add a mana of any color to your mana pool. And when you use that mana to cast an instant sorcery spell, you copy that spell. So it kind of goes along with what Calamax is doing. It's just a really good card in general and has a lot of synergy with that deck. 
Oh, yeah, that's not even the only copy thing uh, that I'm seeing on this page. We've got Expansion Explosion, Narset's Reversal, Increasing Vengeance, Reverberate a little further down the page, Twin Cast. And I feel like this is a point that we should bring up some of those copy spells because uh, there's an interaction with Calamax that we missed on our review episode where if it if Calamax is tapped and someone else casts a spell and you haven't cast a spell yet and then you cast one of those copy spells, you can use your copy spell to copy someone else's card, and then the copy that Calamax makes of your copy spell can target your original copy spell, which then is weird, and this is why I don't play Teamer very much, because there's math involved here, or is there? Anyway, you can repeatedly copy your own stuff to make Calamax infinitely big, getting a bunch of plus one counters on that, an interaction that we totally miss, but that definitely makes Calamax really, really deadly, so it is really no wonder that we're seeing so many uh, copy effects, in addition to the fact that those are just really good cards in the first place with his ability, right? Well, in the copy effect, then it doesn't, in, you know, it's not like that's that's of course very 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 effective but it doesn't then do nothing you just then use the last copy to do what you wanted to do anyway if you wanted to actually copy right. a spell so yeah it's disgusting yeah super super cool other really great instance dig through time mystic confluence uh i i'm seeing 18 percent of people uh at the time of our recording right now are adding in nexus of fate the extra turn spell so i'm just like uh oh that's a little dangerous one to copy with calamax seems pretty good. Are there any cards that you see here that are being added to the deck that you don't necessarily agree with, though, that you think maybe people should uh, hold off from adding to the deck? I mean, I'm not a big fan of turnabout outside of combo decks. So seeing that in there, especially if you, I mean, you, you don't want to be untapping Kalamax because then you're going to lose the ability to copy all these different spells that you're trying to cast. Uh, same with Seedborn Muse, where it untaps all your permanents. So if you want to be doing anything like copying all of your spells on other people's turns, Seedborn Muse is not going to be a way to do that. So both of those seem to kind of go against what Kalamax is trying to do. You want Kalamax tapped a lot of times. I see people playing stuff like Springleaf Drum as a way to just tap Kalamax without having to attack. And then you get all your copy triggers. Seedborn Muse and Turnabout don't do that. And, and currently they're both getting added to about 20% of decks, and I'm not a big fan of those additions. Well, I would say at least in, in the case of Turnabout, I mean, you just probably will pick lands with it to generate the extra mana and then tap them all and pick lands with a second copy to do it all again. So Turnabout, even if you just, even if it only reads untap all lands, target player controls, it's still probably pretty good in that deck. You just would never use the creature portion of it. Sure. I, I, this is a really tricky deck. Like I, I th this feature works great if we're talking about something that's a really specific theme or or um, you know even a tribe. Like the the Edgar Markov deck is going to definitely give you some good vampire suggestions and cards in your deck with vampires. Or the Kadena deck we had last year is going to you know show some morphs that you might have forgot or things that do cool stuff with morphs. This is a much more open-ended deck, and what you're going to be doing with your Calamax deck might not necessarily match what somebody else is doing. So, like, while there are probably some obvious cards that anyone building Edgar Markov might not want to run Edgar Markov, I think it's much trickier in this Calamax deck to point at things that people are adding or taking out and argue against them, maybe, because I don't know. The strategy isn't so nearly well-defined about what you're going to be doing with this deck. Right. You could do some of those infinite shenanigans that we just mentioned, or it could be uh, some other bit more combat focus, since that was yeah. a very efficient way of getting Calamax to be tapped, or maybe you're being more tricky with tappy, untappy shenanigans. That's very open-ended. When you said, though, about uh, stuff that is maybe a little bit difficult about um, cards to remove from the Calamax deck, though, I'm going to push back a little bit against that, because when we move down to the cards that are being cut from the Calamax deck, we're seeing a whole lot of stuff being cut at a very high rate. Basically, all of the... Um, Okay, not all, but a whole lot of the original cards from the deck are being taken out of this list. Um, from the Eon Frolicker Otter, to Nascent Metamorph, to all of the Impetuses, um, Primal Empathy, uh, Halden and Paco are being removed, which really, how dare you? They're such, it's such a good boy. Um, you know, Strength of the Tajaru is uh, also being removed, which I don't think that is an original one, but it is also like, wait, why is that here? There's a lot of cards that are being removed from here that I don't think really jive very well with the deck. So um, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. I, I'm seeing a lot of cards that are being cut from this list that I am super here that these need to uh, be taken away to make any improvements um, to that list. Um, are, are there any here, though, that you guys might keep in the deck that you see that people are removing that maybe you would actually recommend um, that they hold on to from that pre-con? I'm, you know, I'm definitely on board with with as the list shows dropping a ton of the creatures and things like auras that's absolutely not what the deck wants to be doing in in any format um 
you know, I do kind of like Evolution Charm as a card. It is instant speed mm-hmm. too, so you can regularly copy it. And it's also one of those cards, the, the problem with a with a copy spell deck like Kalamax was also the problem kind of with, with Raikou where you want to get greedy and run your spells in a way that you know you're going to copy them with Raikou or with Kalamax. But you also don't want to have a deck full of cards that you have no intention of casting until your commander's in play, too. Um, Evolution Charm is one that you can still probably cast and not feel terrible about it on turn two. But it's also still fairly useful if you cast it once your commander's out and tapped as well. So, Yeah, I, I really like Evolution Charm. I think that's one card I personally was had an eye out of. Was, Why are people cutting this? Because it's... If anything, you can use it as a kind of a regrowth type of effect. You can make sure that Kalamax doesn't get chump blocked and die. You give him flying yeah. at instant speed. Uh, the fact that it's a modal spell, I, I like modal spells when you're able to copy it and then choose different modes. So I don't, I don't think that's how it works. You can, actually, oh, you I'm can't, pretty sure you, copy, you can't change modes. Well, I'm pretty sure I'm you out. have to use the same, the same. <laughs> <laughs> Matt's off the show. I'm, 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 I'm gone. <laughs> no, I, I still like Evolution Charm. I still. But, uh, I think charms and just any modal spells in general are a little underrated. So I, I would keep evolution charm around for the reasons that Dana pointed out too. And hey, maybe even add in more charms if that's the kind of flexibility that you're looking for to make it a very tricky deck. Which brings me to my other question. We've looked to a couple of cards that people are adding, a couple of cards that people are cutting. Are there any cards that you would remove from the pre-con that don't seem to be uh, showing up on this cards to cut page or any cards that you would want to add to it that people don't seem to be adding just yet? What are some other things that you would want to... Um, sort of prune or spruce up this deck list to make the precon even stronger um myself um you know when i was looking at building a calmax deck once upon a time um in the far far distant you know five days ago um <laughs> i, I i've been pondering doing it with like kind of combat damage tricks i like the idea of turning you know a buff that gives a creature plus five plus five into a plus ten plus ten and sneaking through damage um, or things that double damage, being able to like double that effect up as well. So, um, if you are not going to be going the you know copy an extra turn effect route or the go infinite on Calmax's body route, like we had talked about, I think there's some some really useful cards there. The um, I had even mentioned on a on a show in the past things like Overblaze that that doubles a the damage a permanent would deal. So I I like the idea of some of those kind of combat tricks in this deck. Yeah, I'm super here for that kind of thing. The Rush of Blood Overblaze yeah. Might of Nephilim is another kind of interesting one. It's a two mana instant that gives something a uh, plus two for each of its colors. So you would get that's a two mana plus twelve for Kalamax. Um, on top of the fact, I mean, because he copies it and then you get a plus one counter on it, so it's actually a plus thirteen. So like that's like a lot of damage out of nowhere. Um, like. Like th- those are those are pretty cool. I I am seeing um very few cards that allow you to tap Kalamax outside of combat. Like there is a smuggler's copter at the time that we're recording this. Um, there's a smuggler's copter that's showing up in 18 uh, percent of decks. It's being added to uh, from those. But I feel like there should be more maybe vehicles or springleaf drum effects or something like that. If combat isn't the way that you're going to end up going with this, having a few other um, options like that. And and I tell you what, another one that I would really love to see here is Force of Vigor um, to destroy potentially four artifacts or enchantments. Sounds really really devastating. Like that's that sounds really really good. And I would love to see more Force of Vigor. I think that's a bit more pricey, though. Um, but mostly, like, ways to help manipulate whether Kalamax is tapped is something I'd also be here for. And actually, since I, you know me, I can never stop talking. Um, the Price of Progress <laughs> is an instant. Uh, price Ooh, of yep. Progress yeah. is an instant yeah. that deals damage to each opponent for each of... Uh, actually, probably each player, but um, for each of their non-basics. And, and that's, like... That can be really, really powerful if people are playing a lot of non-basics and copying that. Like, ooh, that that can be a total game winner, especially if you're uh, playing a lot of stuff that fetches you a lot of basics because you're playing green. Like, that could be totally a swingy thing out of nowhere, too, that I'd really like to see. Yeah, I think any of the burning or the scaling burn effects, I should say, uh, like price progress, progress, seem very, very powerful. Uh, since you guys talked about cards that you want to add, I think some cards that people are keeping around that I maybe I'm not so sure about. Uh, stuff like Goblin Dark Dwellers, I'm not a big fan of five mana to to recast something for three or less. I don't think that's a very good rate for Commander. I think at five mana, there's probably quite a bit of things you could be doing at five mana that are going to be better worth it and fit in better with Kalamax as a Commander. So that's probably one of the biggest cuts that I would say people are keeping a little too often in these decks so far. I, right. I'm also kind of surprised we're not seeing more rituals here. Something like Seething Song, you know, that goes from three mana generating you you five to three mana generating you ten mana. I mean, you're just going to then cast all the spells that turn too. I think those kind of boosts maybe don't feel great in a, in, in a game where you're not copying them, but this kind of deck where you're going to be running 
you know, definitely a copy effect off your commander, but probably more than that, the ability to just generate all the mana in the world off that feels really, really good. And I'm surprised there aren't a few more of those showing up in this list. I think if you're going to do that, you'd want to combine that with some X spells. So if you do want to do the ritual route, sure. make sure you're playing some more Comet Storms or anything, instant speed X spells, especially mm -hmm. because if you're doing it in combat with Kalamax, you need to be making sure you can take advantage of all that mana. Yeah. All right. Let's move on next to another precon here. We're going to move from the Teamer instance deck to the Jeskai Cycling, looking at the Timeless Wisdom precon. What are some of the changes that we are seeing here, guys? So for the Cycling deck with Gavi Nest Warden, where you can pay zero rather than cycle, or then pay the cycling cost, I should say, uh, of the first cycling spell you cast, or cycle every turn. There's so many cyclings on this card. There's so many cyclings. <laughs> so many cyclings. <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, but when you draw your second card each turn, you also get to create a 2-2 red and white dinosaur cat uh, token every turn as well. Uh, so what we're seeing a lot of people do, obviously Astral Slide is one of the most well-known cycling cards and cycling payoff cards, especially that we see. Alhamrit's Archive is one that I absolutely love. That's an artifact for five, a legendary artifact for five mana. If you would gain life, you gain twice that much life instead. And if you would draw a card, except the first one you draw each in each of your draw steps, you draw two cards instead. So if you you know cast a spell and you get to draw a card, you get to draw double. Uh, that's an incredibly powerful effect in this type of deck where you're cycling and you're drawing more than just one card every turn, especially on your turn. Uh, we're also seeing from the main set of Akoria, the unpredictable cyclone, the possibility storm for cycling cards. So we're seeing a lot of just ways to make sure that those cycling spells that you have, whenever you do cycle them, you're getting some sort of payoff for it. And I, I'm in, I'm, a big fan of what these directions are doing. Yeah, a really interesting one here that uh, kind of threw me for a second. I'm like, wait, why is that here? Is Afara, God of the Polis, who uh, lets you draw a card if a creature entered the battlefield under your control during the last turn? Um, and then I realized, oh, because Gavi can mm -hmm. make a cat token and then you only have to cycle one other card. And then Afara is just like, oh, I will draw you that card because of the thing from the last turn. So that becomes a really great engine. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, really great stuff that we're seeing here. Are there any other things that, I don't know, um, maybe jump out that aren't so great? Uh, any other cards here that are kind of like, wait, why is this one being added? Are there uh, other options that maybe, eh, there are better cards than this stuff here? Um, I'm not sure if that's really happening for me. I think I like most of the stuff that I'm seeing here that people are adding, but I just want to throw it to you guys and see if that's uh, the case for you. Um, you know, I get the power of, of niv Perun, Perun, um, but man, that casting cost is brutal in a three-color deck. Mm. I would be very hesitant to run it. Uh, um, you know, I've had problems in a, in a my three-color crash deck with um, just trip black pips on is it Necropolis Regent. Um, yeah, I mean, just triple black has been a challenge with that card to the point where I've since taken it out of the deck. This is twice as difficult, essentially, to cast. Um, it, it's a great card, but like I feel like it's going to burn you unless you are running the absolute perfect mana base. Uh, one that is jumping out to me that is kind of like, hmm, this is a little strange, is a Flourishing Fox from the main Aquaria set. It's a one mana, one one that also has cycling. And whenever you cycle another card, you put a plus one counter on it. Even if you're cycling a lot of stuff, that seems like a pretty slow rate and a small place to begin. So that one does catch my eyes being like, well, that's that's a little weird. I, I'm not sure that there's that. And it, I think that also you kind of have to choose with this deck how you want these win conditions to work because you can use Gavi to make a whole bunch of tokens um, and then maybe try and take advantage of uh, a token win in some way. Um, but then maybe you'd actually prefer to go with something a little different, like a Glinthorn uh, bucket. Like a <clears throat> Glinthorn bucket. It's a, um, um, a, I, I it's heard a vessel for hauling water from place to place. A, a Glinthorn oh, no, bunk. I'm, that's what my grandpa would say. It's like, that's a load of bunk. I, I, I meant, uh, I was hoping to redo that, but now I think we have to keep that mess up in the <laughs> podcast because of your joke. Glinthorn Buccaneer is a three mana, two, four Minotaur pirate that whenever you discard a card, it deals one damage to each opponent. Um, and that could also be a way that you want to do if you want to take the cycling deck and maybe um, really lean into how much you are cycling, doing it multiple times a turn, if that's at all possible. That can deal damage at a really, really great rate that tokens maybe uh, wouldn't be able to meet at that rate unless you're manipulating tokens. So like there's some diversity here and you really have to figure out what you want your win conditions to be. Um, Glinthorn Bucket. I'm never going to live that one down. <laughs> you know, uh, let's you move on to the cards that are being cut from uh, this deck, though. What are the things that we're seeing here, Matt? So as far as things that people are cutting, uh, the impetuses are the first things to go, it seems like. And that's fair. They're a fun political card. But if you're looking to actually win games, I'm not sure how many those are going to help you get there. So it makes sense why those are getting cut. Uh, Agitator Ant actually is one of the highest cut cards as well. That's the, the two in a red for the 2-2 two -two insect. When, and at the beginning of your end step, you can put two plus one plus one counters on a creature that you know an opponent controls, and then you goad those creatures. 
it makes sense. It's not really fitting in with the theme of what Gavi's trying to do. So that's probably why Agitator Ants are not getting uh, kept in the deck. Uh, Portal Mage is another one that it's kind of weird. And it makes sense why it's not getting there. Because if you look at the cards <laughs> that people are adding, it's a lot of cycling cards and it's some payoffs. So anything that isn't either a payoff or an enabler in this deck, people are kind of focusing down, which I'm a big fan of. So it makes sense to kind of get rid of the cards that pull away from the focus. Matt, um, I'm doing this purely because I was embarrassed. Now I need to turn the embarrassment hose on someone else. But you said it makes sense, I think, four times in the last one minute. So that just is something that I... <laughs> I you might say I was compelled to say that it made sense. Don't make fun of me. <laughs> I, but even when I try to make fun of other people, it doesn't work. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. Uh, I do just want to talk about bucket. some of these cards. <laughs> Glenhorn Bucket. Oh, goodness. Um, I, I do want to address some of the cards that I'm seeing cut here, though, because I don't think I agree with some of these. Like the, the ones that you just mentioned there, Matt, um, totally. Yeah, those are kind of strange. But um, Zenith Flare is actually jumping out to me as a card that I'm surprised people are cutting from this uh, from this list. It's a four mana instant, deals X damage to any target, and you gain X life, where X is the number of cards with a cycling ability in your graveyard. So far, at the time that we're recording, it's being cut from 66% of decks. Um, and that just kind of surprises me, because I feel like you do need to um, make sure that you've got some cycling payoffs. And if you can um, be, you know, very, very uber cycling and getting a bunch of stuff into your graveyard, this seems like a great way to just totally deal a bunch of damage. And Jeskai is really good at like copying spells or recasting those spells too, if you want. Um, so I'm a little surprised to see that one there. Are there any other cuts that maybe you guys think are a little questionable? I'm just gonna, I'm going to agree with your Zenith, Zenith Flare that it should be sticking around. Because if you've been playing any arena lately, the 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 companion, the red-white one, where you can... Zirda? Yeah, Zirda. It's all about cycling. Um, I was hit by a Zenith Flare for 25 in, on arena in standard. So Zenith Flare is very, very powerful, guys. Uh, keep it in your decks. <laughs> That's really cool. Uh, so, all right, what about stuff that isn't showing up on this page? Um, any cards that maybe you would actually want to cut um, from the deck that doesn't seem to be uh, being cut a whole lot or any cards that you would add to the deck that aren't showing up on this pre-con upgrade feature just yet? Um, you know, it's one of those things that the land base can always be you know, fairly heavily turned upside down. Um, I, I do think too many cycling lands, and, and especially in this deck, I think there's a tendency maybe to to want to jam as many cycling lands into the deck as possible, and there's a good amount of them in this deck. Um, but they almost always come into play tapped and I think it's fine to have a few, but I don't know if you want half of your lands ET being tapped just in the off chance that you're going to use them to cycle later on. I think that seems risky and I would pull some of those out for sure. Then they're not being pulled or potentially knowing that going in, maybe amulet of vigor sure. would be a good thing to include to, to in add, this deck right. to sort of. Yeah, that could be something interesting there. Uh, I kind of agree with the mana base. I And this kind of applies for any of these. Sure. Uh, Myriad Landscape is a card that we've kind of questioned in three color decks specifically. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, people are only cutting it from 11% of decks. And I think that number probably should be a little bit higher. Um, but as far as cards that aren't people are not adding, find some sort of really powerful payoff. I mean, we, we mentioned Zenith Flare, something that people are cutting. Having a payoff beyond Astral Slide to kind of just accrue value with your Cloud Blazers that people are adding into the deck, but have some way to close the game because one thing that we kind of noticed and we've talked about ourselves is you're going to be doing a lot. You're going to be seeing a lot of cards every game, but how are you closing the game with a Gavi deck? That's kind of our biggest concern. So make sure you're just, whatever you're adding, it's a way to actually win the game. Yeah, a card that jumps out to me, um, and this one is just a common from the Ikoria set, but Dranith Stinger is a 2-mana two 2-2. Two -two. Whenever you cycle another card, uh, it deals 1 damage to each opponent. Um, so if you are leaning into it, that could actually deal a whole lot of damage. It doesn't apply to all discards, um, but like the Glinthorn Bucket, I think, <laughs> uh, does apply to all discards. But, um, you know, this is actually pretty sly. That could actually deal a whole lot of damage if you're, uh, you know, working around that. Um a big thing also that I think is kind of important, we mentioned that like stuff like Astral Drift um, is being included in a whole lot of decks. And so maybe including some more blink targets for this deck might also be pretty good. Stuff like Mnemonic Wall, Archaeomancer, uh, Scholar of Ages. That way you can cycle a card, blink one of those creatures, which will then return an instant sorcery uh, back to your hand. And if that one has cycle, then you can just do it all again. And then that will get you tons of cycling payoffs to feed into your Dranus Stingers or your Glint Horn Buckets and stuff like that. Uh, so that might be something, too, to put in there. Um, a couple of 
good blink targets could be a way to also um, maneuver a win condition because you want to have uh, a few of those and Astral Drift should have a really great juicy target to blink for that. I think that those are some other cards that I would be interested in seeing here too. Alrighty, before we get to the other pre-cons, we want to take a brief pause and challenge these stats. There's a ton of information here on EDA Trek, but we don't always agree with it. Sometimes we think that cards are seeing too much play. Sometimes we think that cards are seeing too little play. So we like to talk about those cards here. Matt, do you want to start us off this week with Challenge the Stats? I sure can. So one of my favorite commanders from this new set from Akoria is Riel the Everwise. I have been trying to figure out how I want to build the deck. Do I want to tear apart niv Mizzet Perrin and turn into a Riel deck? That's something I've been kind of tinkering with a little bit. I do like that it's very easy to cast, uh, but Riel the Everwise is just one in Izzet colors for an 03 human wizard. Uh, Riel the Everwise, though, does get plus one plus oh for each instant and sorcery in your graveyard. And then whenever you discard one or more cards for the first time each turn, discard that many cards or draw that many cards, excuse me. So one card on the decks that we've seen coming into EDH rec so far that isn't on any of those decks, actually, it's not even showing up on the suggestions page for Riel, is Una's Grace. And that is two and a blue for an instant that says target player draws a card. But the important part here is that the card has retrace, where you can cast this card from your graveyard by discarding a land card in addition to paying its other costs. Now, as a mana sink, as a way to make sure you're casting spells from your graveyard, you always have something going on. It's just a very, very powerful card. You're discarding a card, which basically turns into a two mana instant speed divination if you're discarding a land every turn. But if you're dis if you're drawing a lot of cards, which you probably are doing in it Colors, you're going to have spare lands more often than not. I can't count the times that I've had someone or some lands just sitting around in my hand when I'm playing niv Mizzet. So I think Una's Grace is a nice way to make sure you're drawing a lot of cards. You can keep three man up if you want to pretend that you have a counter spell, for example. Maybe you want to play Cancel and, and get somebody real good, Dana. Or you can just play Una's Grace, discard an extra card, and then draw two cards, and you're fueling up Riel. I really like it. The fact that it isn't showing up on the page, I think, is incorrect. I'm not saying it should be in every Riel deck, but it certainly should be in it at least, I would say, 20%, if not a little bit more than that. Yeah, interesting engine there. Not the kind of thing you'd usually think of. And Riel, that might be one of those win conditions to put into the Gavi deck we were just talking about, too, actually. Uh, I'm going to move on to my challenge here. I'm looking at a card that we may have talked about on a previous episode, maybe back in the 40 or 50s or episode 60s or something like that. Um, but man, it's still only showing up in 164 decks on the website, and that just seems wrong. This is Gossamer Chains, a two-mana enchantment that that says you can return Gossamer Chains to its owner, owner's hand. That's its activation cost. That is its activated ability. And the effect that you get for this is to have target unblocked creature deal no combat damage this turn. Man, this is so cool for Enchantress decks. If you're playing something like Tuvasa the Sunlit or Daxus the Returned, this is an amazing piece of defense uh, that you can just put out there. If someone's going to attack you, you can bounce their creature to their hand and then you would get another enchantment activation on it. It's kind of a cool rattlesnake effect and I don't think people are going to want to give you extra, uh, you know, Enchantress triggers to draw more cards or get more experience with Daxus or anything like that. Um, this could be another great thing for uh, Alila Artful Provocateur who also loves to cast a bunch of enchantments. It's just a very underrated defensive enchantment that really synergizes nicely with what these decks already like to do. So I think that 164 decks is criminally low and should show up a lot more in the decks that care a lot about enchantments. I like this even too, to put in a Zerta deck where it's a permanent yeah. that has an activated ability. Oh, hey. Let's you enable that companion clause because usually enchantments are kind of hard to have activated abilities on. This is not a good way to fill that slot. Yeah. Yeah, for the Zerta Companion. Interesting, yeah, because that, that does, you would be restricted from a lot of other forms of uh, removal with the Zerta Clause if that's your companion, and this is a neat way to get some defensive. Yeah, cool observation. I like it. All right, Dana, what's yours? Uh, mine is Scale Up, and I'm going to mention it specifically for Edric Spymaster of Trest decks. Scale Up is uh, one green for a sorcery until end of turn. Target creature you control becomes a green worm with base power and toughness 6-4. Uh, but the key here is it has an overload for four green green. So all those flying men and unblockable one ones you have in that deck, it's just one more way to kill your opponent by overloading it for six mana and suddenly giving all those creatures essentially plus five, plus five, basically. Um, you know, in that deck, 
oftentimes you're trying to like chain extra turns and get into a position where you can win with maybe trying for the hordes or something along those lines. Um, you know, crater hoofs create two, but this is just one more option in the deck. It's a very, very cheap card physically to purchase. And for the six mana it cost to cast, most of the time, by the time you are in a position to cast it, you just kill everybody. So it's just one more win condition in Edric decks, and it should be in way more than 600 decks total on Media Track. Yeah, the, that kind of deck suffers a bit because an overwhelming stampede is the traditional thing we would expect right. to buff. But the creatures are but, all one ones. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I think that actually the scale up would be a great addition too, potentially for Kadena decks because they tend to have a lot of tiny creatures. Sure. The morphs that are two twos. Um, you put a bunch of them out, a bunch of manifests, and they flip over and they're like a, a 2-1 or something like that. And one of the uh, win condition cards that came in that pre-con um, was Biomass Mutation, which doesn't look all that great, but actually is kind of nice when you have that many tiny bodies uh, to be able to take advantage of. Um, and maybe Scale Up would be a thing that Kadena could take advantage of as well. This is a, an interesting one that you shouldn't sleep on cards from Modern Horizons, because oh my goodness, Modern Horizons did some stuff. Yes, There's it did. a lot of cool stuff <laughs> hiding that's, in that's that That's it very politely, Joey. <laughs> did some stuff. <laughs> uh. All right. Let's get back into those pre-cons. We're going to look next at the Mardu Humans deck helmed by Jarena Kudro. Matt, what are some of the cards that we are seeing people adding to the Jarena Kudro deck? So the Jarena Kudro deck is obviously getting a lot of human love. Uh, Mentor of the Meek, Judith the Scourge Diva, those are two cards. Please, sorry, sorry. Please never say human love. <laughs> don't Google okay. that. <laughs> please, definitely don't Google it, no. Uh, but there are a lot of cards that synergize very well with the human tribe within Magic the Gathering. Let's go with that. <laughs> um, but even, even okay. some non-humans, like Angel of Glory's Rise, where when it enters the battlefield, you exile all zombies, but then you also get to return all human creatures from your graveyard to your battlefield. So it's a mass reanimation for all humans that might have, you know, died over the course of the game. Uh, one of Joey's favorite commanders, Sir Conrad the Grim, also yeah. getting added into a pretty significant percentage of decks. So obviously human tribal and just anything that synergizes well with humans on the battlefield. Yeah, very much. Are there cards here that are sticking out to you that might be a little awkward or that you think maybe, eh, I don't know if this one needs to be added as much, um, or does this look like a good suite of additions to the Marty Humans deck? What are your thoughts on some of these cards I, here? I hesitate to say this because I know everyone in the world who plays white loves Mentor the Meek. It's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's much better in a deck that's producing tokens um, so you have mana free to draw those cards. It gets very um, kind of mind's eye. The challenge with mind's eye is, you know, when you cast it, it's tough to leave that mana up to draw the extra cards. Mentor mm -hmm. can get tricky, too, to have the mana up to draw extra cards. I get that it's a human, so there's some added synergy there. So maybe there's just no downside to running it in that case. But... I'd be very cautious about relying on Mentor the Meek as a primary draw source in a deck like this. I think you are going to find you have a tough time getting a ton of value out of it. I am I'm totally here with you on that one, Dana. And this, maybe you don't need a ton of value. Like maybe in this kind of deck, if you draw one card off it, that's good enough. I, I don't think so because, I mean, this is an aggro deck, which means you need to keep your hand stocked. This is really awkward. Like the creature has to have power two or less. Jarena Kudro pumps all of your stuff. And maybe you are playing her later on to be an anthem to finish out the game, but she also still makes a token when she first enters that you'd probably want to take advantage of that. Like, it, it's just very awkward timing, and this is in a deck that contains black, which has access yep. to some really wonderful card draw effects, so the weird sequencing of Mentor the Meek, there's no downside, I guess, because it is a yeah. human, but this isn't the primary source of card advantage, because this we've got access to a color that can draw tons of cards in really amazing ways. Um, so, yeah, I, I, th this one is a f fine addition, yes. but it, it shouldn't be like... Keep your expectations main. in check. Yeah. yeah, well, and, yeah. And one thing, too, it, one of the other cards that people are putting in at a pretty significant percentage of decks is Outlaw's Merriment, where uh, basically uh, you have a one in, or I should say a two in three chance of getting a token that makes uh, Mentor the Meek trigger. Sometimes you might be making a three one human warrior instead of a two one or a one two token, which means that, you know, a third of the time it's not going to trigger Mentor the Meek. So if you're counting on those two synergizing well, I think you can do much, much better than, than that exact synergy right there. 
Or some other cards that people are adding on this page, Door of Destinies, Vanquisher's Banner. There's a mm -hmm. not insubstantial number of anthems on this page that would contradict the mission of the Mentor of the Meek. Right. So that's just a, a little bit awkward there. So I think the Black Draw spells are just going to be so much better, uh, serve you a whole lot better. This is a human, again, so like, again, it, it does get you stuff. Yeah. But if you are looking for sources of card advantage, then you know, making sure that Mentor of the Meek isn't the only one um, is a thing there. And I guess I, I kind of want to harp on this on this a little bit because when we start looking at the cards that are being cut from this pre-con, we actually see on this page that cards like Ambition's Cost are being cut from 30% of the decks that we're uh, measuring no, on this so no, far. No, 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 do not, do not cut Ambition's Cost from this deck. And here's another one, 20% are cutting Painful Truths. Again, a thing that lets you Ugh. draw cards. I'm just like, what? No, those are really good. Don't cut these. What are you doing? Yeah, I mean, well, people are even cutting Magus of the Wheel, which that's not the most reliable card, but even then, like that's that's a very good way. If you're the aggro deck and you're going to be using those seven cards better than your opponents, then Magus is even, a, I think, a more reliable option than Mentor of the Meek. So yeah, some of the cards that people are taking out, especially Outpost Siege. Outpost Siege is such an all-star in so many different decks. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't see why 38% of decks are taking out post siege out. Yeah, there are some cuts that I totally agree with here. The impetus is the Bonders ornament. I don't think we've addressed, but like all of the impetus cards in the Bonders ornaments have been removed from all of the precons. Um, not very sorry about that one. Uh, Humble Defector, eh, that's kind of a, a weird one too. Um, I am actually also seeing Crackling Doom as being removed from this precon too. Three mana instant, deals two damage to each opponent, and then each opponent sacrifices a creature they control with the highest power. Uh, what what that's amazing that's like a card that makes me want to play mardu right, right. i love that spell it's been cut from 45 percent of the decks that we're measuring on this precon feature so far what's going on no that, my voice is, it's making my voice do this that's a perfect <laughs> wording joey that that's exactly how i always feel about crackling doom i always feel like man i wish i had a mardu deck to run that yeah yeah absolutely uh so yeah we're kind of a, a little little confused, I guess, by the stuff that we're seeing here. So let's see if we can make any better recommendations. Are there cards in the precon that you guys do think should be cut instead of some of the stuff we're seeing or cards that should be added instead of some of the stuff that we're seeing on this precon feature, um, measuring what people are doing? What are some other changes that you guys would prefer to make instead of what we're seeing here? Uh, one card I would like to see here is a black uh, sorcery minions murmurs where you, where you draw a card <laughs> only a time. <laughs> and lose a life for each creature you control. It's like um, your signature spell day. Well, it, it's a, it, it is a good card, but like this is the kind of deck where you're going to have a lot of bodies in play and you are in, in colors that have access to life gain too. But like even if you don't have any life gain, just drawing seven cards or something and losing seven life, um, that better do something effective in your deck or you need to maybe re-examine how you've built it. Like that's the kind of card that in this kind of deck is probably going to put you in a good position to maybe win. That's just so much fuel, so efficient. Um, I think that would be a great card to add here. Yeah, cool stuff. Anything else though? I mean, I would like to see more ways to protect your battlefield. I, people are already putting Boros Charm in, which is great. That's a very, yeah. very good card to have. Uh, but keep in mind, and I know it's not a cheap card by any means, but this is a deck that really, really wants to fairy's protection yeah. or just any other those types of effects. It's a very board dependent deck. You, I mean, you. it's all about a tribe that has to be on the battlefield to really do anything. So making sure you just keep your creatures on the battlefield, that's going to be a very, very important thing to keep in mind. And you know, listen, you might have to sell some blood to get it to various protection, but like <laughs> you're making more, you know, just sell some of it and go get that to various protection. I mean, oh, who would have thought goodness. that you can sell like six barrels of, of crude right. oil and you can get a Teferi's protection. There so. we go. <laughs> the guys, it takes so much uh, work to make sure that these, like, <laughs> these jokes are going to be like two I weeks know. in the past. <laughs> anyway, uh, another thing though, like in terms of protecting your board, I really like the idea of blink spells, stuff like Ghostway or Eerie Interlude yeah. because Jarena has that enters the battlefield ability so you can protect your board um, and maybe even if you would lose any tokens because they can't be blinked, Jarena is still going to resupply you with at least one more. Um, so that's another thing that could be interesting or maybe you just want to put in an Ephemerate uh, in the deck to just manually blink uh, Jarena whenever you'd like as well. Um, and then also I think that there are plenty of other anthems that you could take advantage of. We talked about Mercadia's downfall on a previous episode, a personal favorite of mine. Um, Radiant Destiny also sounds kind of cool to give all of those tokens vigilance if they all fit that creature type. Um, and also Adaptive Automaton seems really great too because you can turn it into a human and then it will pump up your other humans. Um, and I actually also want to, there's one other thing that I would be kind of curious. Do you guys like the Kindred spells, which I think were from the 2017 decks? Uh, Kindred 
Kindred Dominance and Kindred. I don't remember what the name of the red one is. Um, it'll be shown on the screen, so I'm sure that people <laughs> who are listening to this are just shouting the name at me. Um, but the Kindred spells uh, that can destroy all creatures other than the type that you choose, um, or one that will copy all of the stuff that you've got of a specific creature type uh, to help attack your opponents. Um, are you guys a fan of those? Would you play those in this tribal deck too? I completely forgot about those, but now that you say it, Kindred Boon actually fits into what I think is, is an important part of the deck too, is making sure that your creatures are indestructible. But mm. any of those Kindred spells, I think, are, are pretty solid. And there's also Harsh Mercy, which is an old um, sorcery for two and a white. Each player chooses a creature type and destroy all creatures that aren't of the type chosen this mm -hmm. way and they can't be regenerated. You just pick humans and yes, your opponent's gonna keep a couple of creatures because they'll just pick whatever is most useful to them or once in a while you'll you know be facing a tribal deck and they'll save their stuff too, but it's almost always going to generate three mana worth of creatures being killed, if not a whole ton of value. Gotcha. While never, while never hurting you at all. Yeah, and I think also there's plenty of stuff to cut from this list that we aren't seeing cut too much. Um, the Cavalry Pegasus that gives your humans flying when they attack, I'm kind of like, oh, is that great? Um, I don't think that it's being cut very much, but Titan Hunter kind of stands out to me as being pretty expensive for a minimal ability. And then when I'm looking through the spells, I feel like there's not a lot of removal here as well, especially considering that people are removing the Crackling Doom. Yeah. Um, I see a handful of things in the deck list, the original one, like Terminate, um, or dire tactics, but I feel like Mardu's really, really good at targeted removal, um, and so sprucing up that part of the of the deck list too could be a really good thing uh, to focus on. All right, we're going to move now from the humans to the mutants. We're looking at the Sultai mutation deck helmed by Otrimi. Dana, what are we seeing here that people are adding to the Otrimi deck? Um, people are adding to the Otrimi deck. Um... Things like Parcel Beast in Zagoth Crystal and Myth of Brokos, basically they're adding a bunch of cards that are actually from the main Akoria set. Yeah, that that sort of that scans. <laughs> um, right, and it makes sense because this is like ostensibly the whole set was supposed to synergize with Akoria, but this is the deck that really synergizes with Akoria. This feels like it's entirely splintered off from the Akoria set, and so it makes sense that a lot of those cards are going to have a home here. Yeah, I think basically our comments on this particular section is all the mutants from Ikoria put them into this deck. Yes. Um, if they aren't already in the list, there are a few that weren't like Sea Dash or Octopus, for example. Um, it's a very cheap uh, mutation card. Um, but kind of an awkward thing, just something I want to take your guys' temperature on for this is I, I was looking through and I did a quick search and I think there are only like 20 total cards with mutate uh, in Sultai Colors just at all. Um, which does put this deck in kind of an awkward position, including all of them, you still only get like 20, and one of those is Otrimi. Um, so like there's not a ton of mutation targets for this deck, which does put it into kind of a weird space, don't you think? It does, but I like what they're doing. So so if you look at the deck, some of the cards that people are adding are cards like Troll Ascetic, Thrun the Last Troll, and Solana Ledgewalker. Those are all mm. kind of boggle type of cards. So they're using them, and most importantly, they're not humans, which means they're very, very good mutate targets. So they're kind of using it, the, the mutate spells, the mutate creatures as auras and using them to buff up a hexproof creature. I like that. That's kind of a creative thing that people are doing. And it's actually kind of cool that they thought of that. I think that's a good lesson too. This the play pattern that I imagined for a deck like this is that you're going to load up one creature as having a bunch of mutations mm -hmm. on it because there are so many cards that say whenever this mutates, do this. And if you stack a bunch of those, then you'll be able to get a bunch of beasts or you'd be able to get um, a bunch of triggers off of that kind of deal. And it actually maybe is more the case that you want to find some tinier creatures that would be really, really excellent uh, to, you know, <laughs> do some stuff with. For example, a card that we're seeing added here, uh, Cephalid Constable, three mana, one, one Cephalid Wizard. When it deals combat damage to a player, return up to that many target permanents that player controls to their owner's hands. Good grief. That sounds ridiculous if you're able to give it a bunch of power. That's something that Rafik of the many players have been doing for so, so long now um, to buff this up and then bounce a bunch of stuff. It does seem like the play pattern of the deck is going to be much more along the lines of finding a tiny creature and putting a mutation onto it as opposed to maybe putting a bunch of mutations onto one, or maybe there's flexibility in it. Uh, yeah, it's just, there's a, a strangeness to this deck that sort of feels maybe a little bit hampered by the number of mutations available. Um, so you do have to thread that needle kind of carefully, I, I, I guess. So what about cards that are being cut from the pre-con? What do we think about this section? So this one, I, I, I like what people are doing and, and the, the cuts make a lot more sense and fit in the deck 
than the Mardu deck, for example. The, what people are cutting are stuff like Boneyard Mycodrax, which is a card with Scavenge, and it has power and toughness equal to the number of creature other creature cards in your graveyard, which is fine, but if you're trying to kind of spread the love, I don't know if it's really doing what the rest of the deck wants to be doing. Or, or Mast Admirers is another card that it doesn't really make sense, doesn't contribute to the overall theme. So if you're doing kind of the, the Boggles-type game plan, and you're just trying to make big soul type beasts, then neither of these cards are really doing a whole lot. Hero's Bane is a plus one, plus one counters type of card. So the top cards that people are cutting, it, it, I, I get why they're cutting them out of the deck. Yeah, this is a very divided precon because a lot of the cards were added to synergize with Zaxara the mm -hmm. Exemplary also mm -hmm. being cut from the deck, which cares a lot about X spells. So that puts the deck into a very, very strange place. Like the Hydras do kind of make sense because you can make a tiny Hydra and put a big mutant onto it if you want, or you can make a big Hydra and then give it a base power with the mutant and then all the plus one counters will still carry over. But even then it is kind of a, an awkward position to be in. And I think a, really a vast majority of the precon can kind of go if you want to be focusing more on the mutation and stuff. If you want to make room, there's a lot of stuff that synergizes with the other commanders that you can easily toss to make room for them. Well, and, and there's a lot of cards, and we've seen this in all these decks, you know, the impetus cards are coming out of basically all of these decks. I don't know if the impetus cards are necessarily bad. I don't think they're great, but they're not terrible. No. But they don't do the thing that the deck wants to be doing. And these decks all want to do a real specific thing. And mm -hmm. you, as the pilot tend to want to see your deck do that specific thing. That's why you've built it. That's why you've you know, gone into mutate or you've gone into cycling. You want the deck to, to kick off and do a bunch of those splashy things. So of course, the first things you're going to cut out would be cards that don't do those things. And I think that's a lot of the victims and a lot of these decks of the cuts are just cards that while they might be perfectly fine, they just aren't doing what you want the deck to be doing. Yeah. There are some other things that I would want to see cut from the deck too, though. I'm like the Mast Admirers um, sort of stood out. I think also one that stands out to me is like Widwin, the Biting Gale, um, is a fairy wizard that shows up here with flying that can return itself to your hand by paying two mana and a life. And I'm just like, this is, I don't know, that's kind of lackluster. Uh, Yavamaya Dryad is a weird one to see here as well. There are other mana dorks that uh, might be better. Um, I just feel like there's a lot uh, that could you know, be desired here. Um, but then also, I guess I wonder if there are other types of cards that you would add. We know that you'd probably want to stuff a bunch more uh, mutation cards from the main set in here. Um, are there any other things that might synergize with that strategy that you guys can think to add to the precon list that would help spruce up that strategy after they've added in all of those mutants? Um, I, you know, I do think Matt made a really great point talking about the troll aesthetic and Thrun having hex proof on whatever giant beast you put into play is so, so useful, um, let alone regenerate, which isn't you know, necessarily terrible either. Um, I, I think it's, I'd be very tempted to look for a few more kind of keyword soup cards, particularly non-human ones that could give my mutate creature multiple abilities to guarantee I poke through, even like Vampire Nighthawk kind of cards. That's a you know, great example of a card that's efficient, easy to, to cast, and then being able to mutate onto something and give it flying and death touch and lifelink. Like that mm. kind of card, I feel like I, I would want to be looking to add more of those kind of things to this deck. I, th I think the biggest thing that I would be looking to add to this deck is some sort of draw engines. There isn't really any in the pre-con. Uh, there's 38 creatures, which is a huge amount. Um, yeah. But when you look at all the kind of draw spells or anything, everything, it really leans it hard into depending on Lifecrafter's Bestiary, which is in the pre-con. And that's a very good card for this type of deck, especially if you're using creatures as kind of an aura type of spell. Uh, but there's not a whole lot else to, to really keep you drawing cards. Uh, I, I know it's expensive, but, you know, your your Ristic Studies and those types of cards, uh, those are going to be good cards to help keep, you know, more creatures in your hand so you can keep casting everything. Uh, the Great Henge would be insane here. Uh, so anything, just make sure that it's rewarding you. It's getting cards in your hand because I could see this deck really struggling to... Uh, it, maybe it draws the wrong half of the deck or you just run out of gas and then you're kind of sitting there and just trying to do anything. So, so I've got I've got two kind of weird observations here, I guess. Like one of the things that jumps out to me that mutants might be good for, sort of like Matt, you were talking about, you know, getting those smaller creatures, the ledge walkers or the um the, the Cephalid Constables and stuff like that. Um, I'm wondering if what this might end up being, like when you look for tiny creatures that would have a, a big payoff if they hit someone, um, if they had more power, I mean, Infect inevitably jumps out to me here. So stuff like Phyrexian Crusader, Blight Mamba, Plague Stinger, um, all seem pretty good. So I'm wondering if maybe leaning into Infect is actually a good direction to make this 
uh, a, a, you know, get a bit more punch. That's a controversial uh, thing for, for some players. <laughs> they don't like infect in commander so much, but that could be powerful. So instead of just that um, observation, like that's a thing that could happen is basically what I want people to be prepared for. But the other thing I kind of want to throw out here, I haven't fully developed this idea, but I just want to toss it into the ether. Would Brokos be a better mutate deck if that's the strategy that you're going for, where you're not piling up a whole bunch of stuff on at once, but like if there are only 19 other mutate cards that you can even get back from the graveyard with Otrimi's ability, would it be better to just let, if your mutated creature dies and Brokos goes to the graveyard and then you can cast it again, avoiding command tax and still getting a 6-6 six, six body, would that be better? I'm not sure. I just kind of wanted to toss it out there and make you guys do the mental work for me on that front. <laughs> it, just, um, it just sort of popped into my head and I kind of wanted to vo vocalize Always it. Always making us do the heavy lifting, <laughs> Joseph. I, I see how it is. I do think it's definitely a situation where you could swap those two out and not necessarily feel like you have to change really anything in your deck at all. Yeah. Hmm. So it's probably yeah, a I, fairly easy thing to test out. It probably comes down to what feels best and what you like to lean into sure. uh, between Otrimi okay. and Brokos. Because... I, I could see you wanting to have Brokos in the graveyard more reliably, but Otrimi's ability is also very powerful because that's a that's a pretty decent engine, uh, good card advantage built in anyway. So depends on what you value more out of your commander between Otrimi and Brokos and just kind of flip a coin almost. Yeah, I really like that they are tying the precons to the set's main themes. I just wish that this one had gotten a lot more support uh, from that because only 20 total Sultan Mutants, it feels like you you know, needs maybe a little bit more. Uh, this deck probably requires the most tuning and pruning to make sure that you find the strategy that you want with the mutation ability. Um, and that just leaves one more precon for us, the Obzon keyword counters deck helmed by Cathril. Guys, what are we seeing here that is being added to the precon? So they're they're obviously loading up on some way to get those graveyard shenanigans going for Cathril. Stuff like Buried Alive is the most added card to the deck just because it gets three creature cards from your graveyard into your battlefield. You can put stuff like, oh, Catcher the True. Oh, they're also adding that card to the deck. Uh, that's a <laughs> good way to get Double Strike and Indestructible to your team. Uh, Leyline Prowler also has Death Touch and Lifelink, and also is just a decent little mana dork. Uh, also, Basara Tower Archer. That's an interesting one that people are adding at about a third of the decks. Is It's just a Hexproof and Reach creature for two mana. Um, it makes a a lot of sense. I know I, I've been saying that a lot, apparently, uh, <laughs> but people have done a very good job at kind of figuring out where these decks are, are trying to go. It's not super scattered anymore, like we've seen with pre-cons in years past, but people are focusing down really well on what kind of cards they want to they want to look into. Uh, Questing Beast is another card that's added in almost 30% mm -hmm. of decks, and that's just keyword soup along with, you know, 80 cards of or 80 lines of card text. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I like what people are doing here. They're they're fitting multiple keywords onto onto single creatures as a way to really fuel up that graveyard for Catherill's ability. Yeah, this is easily my favorite of the pages that we've looked through. You're getting a bunch of stuff, a bunch of creatures with great keywords, um, a, a really diverse range of them, but also a bunch of stuff that puts stuff into the graveyard. So of course I like it, right? Um, Underrealm Lich is an interesting way to you know fill the graveyard up. Fauna Shaman can toss away the cards you don't like. There's a lot of stuff that I really enjoy here. Even Perpetual Timepiece, a lovely pet card of mine uh, that can mill you incidentally. That's showing up here on this page too. This makes me really, really happy happy. Um, but then I have to ask if there are any cards that are being added here that maybe don't make you guys as happy, or do you like the page as much as I do? What do you think? You know, I think most of this stuff makes sense to me. Um, uh, of the ones we looked at, I feel like this is probably the most logical set of cards being added. There's very few things I would have to complain about here. Do you guys feel the same yeah. way or is that just me? I, I I really do. And this is where I want to stop actually because I was scrolling down the page a little bit more and I saw another card that I really like for this deck. <laughs> um, sorry, Skullbriar, the Walking Grave. This was like the absolute winner of the set in terms of keyword counters because it can keep all those counters yeah. even if it's in the graveyard. So it's a, a two mana one one that whenever it deals damage to a player, you get a plus one counter on it, but the counters remain on it even if it moves to a zone other than the hand or library. Um, so like that's just phenomenal because if you put keyword counters onto it with Cathril and then it winds up in the graveyard, and then you replay Cathril, you'll be able to get all of those counters because Skullbriar has all of those abilities from the graveyard. Like, this is really great. I'm glad to see that that one's being added. The only reason that it's not being added to more is probably because it's like a $7 card now. Like, oh, that one's a great, great addition for this deck. I really like the cards that we're seeing here. Yeah, the um, only one that I don't really jive with super well is Carnage Tyrant. It's just a six mana big beater. Yes, it has two keywords on there, but for as expensive as a card of, of a card it is, I just don't know if that's as good. I think you can get the CMC lower 
and then have those keywords on a different creature that isn't six CMC and the can't be countered clause doesn't carry over. Cathrol doesn't grant that. So I think Carnage yeah. Tyrant is probably one of the cards that people are adding that you could probably do better. But people are playing Final Parting, and that's one of my favorite cards the past <laughs> couple of years. Oh, it's so good. Cool. Uh, so then that moves us to the cards to cut from the deck. A lot of the same stuff that we've seen before, but then also a smattering of Matt, just like you mentioned, really expensive creatures in the deck. Uh, stuff like Calumny's Captain. Um, Avoid Beckoner is being uh, removed, which actually really surprises me uh, that this one's being cut from 54% of them uh, that we're seeing so far. Because this is a creature with Death Touch that has a cycling ability um, that you can then just immediately put into the graveyard. Uh, so that one kind of surprises me. But basically, a lot of the big creatures are what we're seeing here. Um, do you guys like the cards that are being cut or are there maybe ones that you would want to keep what you thinking i'm I, I, i'm genuinely shocked that soul flare was even in the deck in the first place it, it's so <laughs> like I, I guess i'm i'm not because it kind of on first glance reads like the kind of card that does what this deck does where it has a bunch of abilities technically but they only exist really when this creature's in play and it's going to take cards away if you use a delve ability that your commander wants to use I just feel like there's so many contradictory things in that card that I absolutely get why everyone looks at it and goes, I don't even want to deal with this in this deck. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That I, I agree 100%. Soul Flayer, I, I understand why it was in the deck, but yeah. I agree that it, it should be taken out as soon as you open the package. <laughs> Um, but when we talk about some of the, the stuff though, that like maybe should also be cut, like there are some cards in this deck list that I'm surprised aren't being, you know, cut from most of them like that, uh, like that Netherborn altar. I think that one absolutely needs to go. That one needs to, you need to take that out of that deck. I, I, mm, I don't like that card. Any other cards that you guys uh, see from the original pre-con list that you're kind of like, wait, why is this one sticking around? We should toss this one to make room for better stuff. I'll mention yeah. this cause it's kind of become meme status, at least among us. Um, <laughs> Deadbridge chant. <laughs> Oh, Dead yeah. Bridge okay, chant yeah. never works. <laughs> I know what you think it's going to work this time because I've thought it's going to work this time. And I've thought that 20 different times in 15 different decks over the course of the last five years. It just never works. So oh, cut man. it from this deck before you become me who has four oh, of yeah. them in their house and a binder somewhere because you keep thinking it's going to work. It's not going to work. So that's when I would definitely <laughs> cut that's not being cut enough. Uh, so I, I, I'll take that a step further too than Dana. Uh, any of the reanimation type of package cards like Ever After, people seem to be keeping around a decent amount. I'm not a big fan of that. I think there are much, much better reanimation spells. You can just go big with Joey's favorite card of Rise of the Dark Realms. Just pay a few extra mana and get all the creatures instead of just two. That seems like a good trade-off. Uh, we talked about selective adaptation and how it, there's quite a few hoops to jump through. Not a big fan of that one either. So I think there's just some marginal cards that you can kind of just tinker with a little bit and improve too. There's nothing to me as egregious as Deadbridge Chant is to Dana, but there are some some little cards, just some fine tuning you can do like Ever After that just... Yeah. It's not terribly efficient, and you could just do much, much better. Yeah. Uh, here's a possible replacement for this. So there are some cards that I wish would show up more, and this is some uh, cards that I really think can boost up Cathrol. Um, if you don't like Deadbridge Chant very much, maybe you will like Doom Whisperer, which can help you fill up your graveyard and is a really great body that provides you with the flying and the trample. Like, it's got keywords. It's a great beater. I think that slots right into the deck. That's a card that isn't showing up on these pages that I really think ought to. And then here's one that totally shocks me. Concern Concerted effort is only being added in so far at this rate of 6% from the pre-con upgrades. Concerted effort, it's basically an Audric enchantment version that spreads around the keywords that you that you give out. Like, I can't believe that this one's showing yeah. up so low. That one totally needs to go into the deck list. There are, I, I really enjoy a lot of the uh, upgrades that we're seeing so far, but there are a few more that you can make that will push this over the ledge too. Um, yeah, there's uh, th this, I, I like most of this page, but man, concerted effort, get that into this Cathrol deck. That's, you're going to be so happy with it. This deck is very much a kind of, um, season to taste kind of thing if you're thinking in terms yeah. of cooking where like you add a pinch of salt and need to taste it to see if that's where you want it at there's <laughs> so many things you want to be doing here whether it's like putting your own cards in the graveyard or maybe having the ability to reanimate some of those cards or finding the correct mix of keywords so you're not duplicating too much and i think the only way to really do that is to just get a lot of reps in with this deck so I think people sure. who build this are going to make it and then have to make a lot of changes as they go because there's really no way to, to eyeball that without just playing the deck. 
Yeah, absolutely. Like timing when you play the commander is going to be interesting because yeah. you need stuff in the graveyard. Are you trying to make it a Voltron to make Cathro as big as possible? Give him all the words. Or do you want to have a big board that Cathro will help feed? There is definitely a, yeah, season to taste is a great way uh, to describe it. So there is a lot of flexibility that you can do. And you also need to determine which of the keywords matters most to you mm -hmm. to get into the graveyard first. Do you need the hexproof and indestructible? Or do you have too much of that going on? We saw, Matt, you had mentioned a card that has reach that is pretty rare among a lot of the cards that we're seeing. And that can give another thing to Cathrill, another plus one counter, and that can be pretty valuable. You know, how much double strike do you have? Because, I mean, double strike is going to make all those plus one counters feel a whole lot better too. So look out for the double strike cards. There's a lot of flexibility that you can do with that. And I mean, Joey just likes a big graveyard. Don't know what else to tell you. All <laughs> no, right. That's any not other... breaking news, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really isn't. Uh, any other final thoughts that you guys have about these precons and the cards that we're seeing upgraded, removed, added? Um, any other final thoughts that you have about uh, the this feature that you'd want to throw out before we call this episode to a close? I think it's safe to say that regardless of, of commander and which, you know, head legend for the decks, looking through the precon upgrades, there's probably four or five cards that I never would have thought of on my own. Uh, I really like that mm -hmm. people are, are are finding some of these really cool synergies, like how Calamax can you know accidentally go infinite. I think that's cool when commanders you know you have to do a little bit of digging, and and I know some people immediately think of it, but to the greater public when they're like, oh, I didn't even think of that. Like that's a really cool thing to see that all of these commanders. I mean, like I said, using mutate creatures as kind of an aura on a boggle type creature that is super cool. I I love that synergy. So yeah. So everything you know there's there's at least one or two things with each of these decks that people are doing that it makes me much much more of a fan of, of these decks than i was a couple of weeks ago that's good to hear yeah I, I i kind of had the same feeling matt like i i liked these commanders much more talking about upgrading them than maybe i did looking at them in the abstract when we were reviewing them i don't know why mm. that is but um they're much more interesting in looking at this way than they were just kind of doing it cold. Sure. Well, and and Matt, that's one what you just mentioned. There is one of my favorite things about EDH Rec is that it helps you find uh, really great ideas that yeah. other folks have had, and that's like like you said, there are so many of these synergies that we might not have been able to come up with on our own. So it's really great to see. Um, I don't know. It's almost a little bit of teamwork, basically. And actually, in the comments mm -hmm. below, listeners, we would totally love it if you would provide any other ideas that you have to upgrade these decks to. Any other cards that you think um, should be showing up on their pages to help your fellow brewers out, because that's really what EDA Trek is all about. And uh, on that note, I think we ought to call this episode to a close. Thank you guys so much for joining me. And if our listeners would like to get in touch with you, where can they find you all? Matt? So you can find me on the Twitters and also the Twitch at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And Dana. You can find me on the Twitter birds at Dana Roach, and you can hear me a couple times a week on my other podcast, CMDR Central. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter, and you can find the cast at EDH RecCast on Facebook and on Twitter. If you have a question, a keen insight to EDH Rec's data, or maybe a challenge to stats pick that you think we ought to know about, you can contact us at EDHRecCast at gmail.com. Our thanks again to Josh LeQuay and the whole team at the Command Zone for handling the post-production work on the podcast, and of course, our thanks to our sponsors, TCG Player and Card Kingdom. They're seriously great, and you can find them using the price info links on EDH Rec, or by visiting cardkingdom.com slash EDHREC to help show your support for the show. We'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Mm -hmm.